People and purpose are key drivers of performance, but are most often overlooked. The reshaping of our society is demanding a more engaged workforce to achieve on all fronts. Yet most organizations often don't know how. They are forced to rethink what they stand for, the stories they tell, and how they are articulating and living on their purpose. I'm your host, Michelle Roberts, and welcome to Purpose First. Learn how top business leaders think, act, and achieve more by turning businesses into movements, by putting people and purpose first. I am pleased to welcome Carrie Leslie, CEO of Verity, as my guest today. Verity is obsessed with creating truly sustainable packaging solutions within the beauty and personal care industry. They're on a mission to raise the standards in the pack packaging industry to minimize single-use plastic and waste. How are you, Carrie? I'm great. Thanks so much, Michelle, for having me. Pleasure to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and your career, your background. How did you get started? Sure, yeah. So I actually, I started my career in the medical device space. So I spent about 15 years in medical device manufacturing. So I worked for manufacturers. Um, I worked for a startup company and then a really large global manufacturing distributor of medical devices and um, really got to have some great experience in the startup space to really build a company from the ground up and see what it takes, uh, the amount of people and effort that it takes to bring a product from concept all the way through to market. Um, And then was fortunate to go work for a global organization and see how There are some really great efficiencies of process that you can gain, um, but it really slows things down. (laughs) So it was great to have both of those experiences. But um, in 2015, I I started a a little natural deodorant company as a side project. So it was completely outside of anything I'd ever done, but I was really frustrated that I couldn't find a natural deodorant that worked. And I was um, a young mother. Was my first, I had my first daughter and was really thinking about just putting on my body. So yep. I started looking for, not, I don't know if you've been on that journey, but I oh, bought a lot. It's so hard <laughs> to find a natural deodorant that works. <laughs> I haven't sent you some. I've got to send you some of our deodorant because I'll get there in a minute on the story, but I've got a good oh, one. I love that. Um, so essentially I, I paired up with this woman who had made this really great formula for a natural deodorant. She's a, she was a really, really just a talented visionary and created this awesome formula that she made at home. She was an esthetician, really understood the skin. And she'd been spending, also has been spending years working on a natural deodorant formula. Um, so we decided just to pair up and start this natural deodorant company. And it was a side project, um, and the company's called Noni Co. We made this great product that was healthy for your body and the planet. And then we were pouring it into these plastic containers and it just didn't feel right. And we didn't want to be creating more waste. And at the time we were under the impression that these plastic containers were highly recyclable. And when we looked for more eco-friendly containers, we really couldn't find anything. So we told ourselves, well, at least these are getting recycled. So this is the best we can do. Um, and and that's kind of where we stopped for a couple of years. We were making this deodorant and this plastic container. And then three years into the business, uh, we hear this statistic that only 9% of plastic is getting recycled. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Is that the, that's not happening to our containers. (laughs) So we went to a, um, the local recycling facility, we started digging in to do research, but we went to the local recycling facility and asked them, so how often is our container getting recycled? Because we had selected this mono material plastic that supposedly if it's all one material, it would be much easier to recycle. And they kind of laughed at me at the recycling center and were like, look, I hate to burst your bubble here, but these things are never getting recycled. And they said, it's not because it's not recyclable. It's because there's no market for these types of containers. So they get so much volume of this plastic to the recycling centers and the sorting facilities. And the way they make money is they sell these materials to people who can reclaim them and they don't have buyers for plastic like this. So what ends up happening is they just have to get rid of it. And essentially the only place, so that's when you hear about these stories for years, we've been sending all this plastic to China. That's literally the only place that they could find a home for it. And it was relatively inexpensive for them to get rid of the plastic that way. 
Um, and these guys don't feel good about what they're doing, right? Like they, the right. recycling bins show up at their, the recycling bins that are picked up by their trucks are just full of this stuff and they don't have anywhere to put it because nobody will take it. So wow. we started digging in more to say, okay, well, what is desirable in the recycling chain? How do you make money? And they said, scrap metal, glass, like these are highly recyclable in our region. And they're like, metals are highly recyclable everywhere because it's way less expensive to buy scrap metal than to go and mine new virgin materials. And something with plastic is, aside from it not being very valuable because virgin plastic is really cheap, um, it's also, it also loses its material characteristics where metal actually will maintain its characteristics through multiple recyclings. So at that point, we thought, well... Well, then why aren't we just putting more desirable materials into the recycling stream? Because since they make money from these materials, they invest really heavily in the equipment to identify and store it and collect these materials to get it ready for a buyer. So we went back and said, well, what if we can make a container that was reusable for 10 years? And then at the end of life, you could toss it into a recycle bin and it will actually get recycled. So that's what we did. So we designed a stainless steel reusable deodorant container. And that's when my background finally came in handy because I'd been in metal manufacturing and and the medical space. And we used to bring back surgical instruments to clean and sanitize them in between surgeries. So I was like, if we can do this for medical devices, we can do this for deodorant. Wow. So, So that's what we did. So we launched this reusable stainless steel deodorant container and we took it to market. We, we actually took a prototype to a trade show and finally for this tiny little deodorant company, but finally everybody was paying attention to us. We had these brands coming up to us that had never talked to us before re- retail brands. And then oh, we wow. had a ton of the other deodorant companies coming up to us and saying, where did oh, you get wow. that? Container? We've been really struggling to find authentically sustainable packaging and everything we find is kind of compromising the user experience or the aesthetics. And these are really beautiful. So we told them, oh, well, we didn't buy them somewhere. We, we'd made them and we're happy to kind of point you guys in the right direction of how you could do this. And it was pretty apparent after the 10th or 15th conversation that none of these brands wanted to make their own packaging. They needed help. <laughs> this area right. that they did not have expertise and they asked for our help. So that's the point where we decided, wow, I think there's a real need in this market and we could add a lot of value with our experience in manufacturing and our understanding of what a brand's going through when they're trying to find sustainable packaging to be able to solve some of those problems. So we started Verity and we pulled together some experts in metal manufacturing and then some folks from the marketing side who really understand the aesthetics and the user requirements for personal care and beauty packaging and started Verity. Awesome. And how long ago was that? So uh, we officially started in January of 2020, but there was an awful lot of legwork going on (laughs) before then and just um, really understanding the market. So, I mean, we really studied the market. I summarized for you, right, was probably years of conversations with these recycling facilities and really understanding what they go through. But we officially launched the company in um, early 2020. Wow. That's awesome. Right in the, was it, it was pre-COVID then, correct? Um, it was just barely pre-COVID. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. And, launched, and then the pandemic hit quickly thereafter. But we, like I said, we had done a lot of the work leading up to it. So we actually had a lot of customers mm-hmm. who were asking us to help them before the yep. company started. Yep. Um, so we were fortunate in that way that we we had business and we'd had the foundational team on board that could be an yep. execute. Yep. Yeah. So you did, you did the legwork in the very beginning, you did your homework and got to understand the customer and their needs, their wants, desires. And it sounds like you've been passionate about sustainability um, for a long time. So how did that passion evolve and into your purpose as a leader and then into the company itself? So what's funny is I actually, I, I wish I could say that I was, but I think I, I wasn't as informed or passionate about sustainability my entire life because I wasn't aware of the problem. It was I was basically wish cycling my whole life, thinking that everything I put into the recycle bin was getting turned into something else, which I think most of our, us are probably in that situation. And yeah. I think what really struck me when we first started learning about some of the pieces that are broken in the recycling system is how unaware we are of these problems. 
Yep. And I, so it really sent us on a mission, not just to solve the problem and create options for these brands, because the brands want to do the right thing, but they're in the same situation. They didn't realize that what they were doing was harmful. And then when they're getting called out for it by the consumer, they're embarrassed and they, right. they feel bad about it. Like these, these brands really are focused on creating formulas that are better for the planet and our bodies. And when they became aware that they're also creating a problem with this plastic waste, they authentically want to make a change. So I'm inspired to be able to help them, but also to educate. And we try to really become an educational resource to all of our brand partners so that they can make decisions and feel really good about them based on the current information that's available on the market. Absolutely. And where are you located? We're in San Diego. San Diego. Sunny, yeah. sunny San Diego, right? <laughs> sunny San Diego. That's right. We're lucky we get to live here. None of us are originally from here. A lot of, a lot of transplants in San Diego, but oh, we yeah. for the weather. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Upstate New York is no, no San Diego. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this time of year, it's great. In January, come visit. <laughs> yeah. Come once a year, you know. <laughs> Um, and how many people do you have on your team? So um, we have we have about like 10 people that are in the office, but we have a lot of folks that work, especially with COVID, it's really helped to be able to expand um, and work remotely. So it's like another 15 people that are doing remote work and contributing to the team. Can you share with the viewers um, your uh, Verity's purpose? Yeah. So, I mean, I think what I just shared is really what inspired us to get here, right? We we saw a need in the market. We personally experienced that. And it's our goal to be really just serving our customers through empathy. So we can really put ourselves in their shoes and think, okay, what would we want a supplier to do if they were, if we were in their shoes? So yeah. if, if we can support them and do what we would expect to be done for us, then, um, then we're meeting our goals and our purpose. Yep. And um, what is one of your favorite client stories, like one of your customer stories? Because it sounds like you help them become a better, better organization. They can connect better with their consumers because of the product that you're creating. Yeah, I think um, we have one client that had been working on a solution similar to what we were able to do for them for a year. And when we walked into their conference room, they were like, we've been working on this for a year and this is so much better. Wow. <laughs> we just, we just decided we're not going to do this internally. We're going to work with you guys. And um, I think that's one of the early moments that clicked. It was before we had become the company. Like I said, we've gotten a lot of our customers early on before we incorporated um, I think that was a moment where we realized we can add so much value and really be an extension of the team of these mm -hmm. companies so that they don't have to try to solve these problems that they're not familiar with solving. And we can move it, the, the movement towards more sustainable packaging and less single use plastic. We can help people get there faster. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. So we all know that it's just, it purpose is great, but it's only as good as how much we can build it in, bake it into every part of the culture and the people and um, be, have it become part of the expression of the organization. What are some ways that Verity and your team do those, some of those things? So I think you're entirely right. And I think it really starts even as a tiny company, right? As one person and then going into two people and three people, it's just really bringing on the right team members with the same mentality. And then a lot of the things that you want the company to be doing are happening naturally. It's not even a strategic plan, right? You're just bringing on the right people who are gonna make decisions that are in line with your ethos and defining your core values and your mission really early on and making sure that's a part of the hiring process is hiring people that align with that. I think is really important and that it really even includes our investors. I mean, we've, I got advice early on to just basically, Hey, you've got this vision and this plan. You don't have to be best friends with your investors, but like you need money. So just going to have to take it. And we've been really fortunate. And I would actually give the opposite advice to any <laughs> entrepreneur because we've been really fortunate to have very mission driven investors and mission focused investors who are part of our team and they add so much value and support along the way. And one of them um, actually recently was having a conversation with me about how there's, we need to always approach growing the business with the four dimensions of wealth is what she calls it. So, and one dimension is financial 
And then the second dimension is personal relationships, right? Making sure that we're working with people that we align with and that we can be proud to be doing work with. And that's our team. That's our customers. That's our investors. Mm -hmm. Uh, The third was being able to make an impact and feel really good about what we're putting all of these resources and people's time and entire lives, (laughs) all the hours that we spend at work towards making a great impact. Yep. And then um, also the, the legacy that we're leaving behind as an organization and leaving the world to be a better place for the next generation. And it's imp- I think that's something we naturally did, but I really liked the way that she spelled that out. And just every big decision you're making as a company should just be thinking of these four things and making sure that there's be- we're being um, focused not just on the accumulation of financial wealth, but really focused on those three other things in all aspects of the business. It's going to make us a better company and serve our customers better. Absolutely. Yeah. Those guiding principles are awesome. I love them. Um, and so it sounds like the way you embed the purpose and really develop the organization starts with people, starts with, like you said, hiring the right people that are aligned with your cause um, and value the same things you do. Um, and then you have, um, yeah. your, you know, the guiding principles as well. Awesome. Um, so mm-hmm. tell well, me about- I think revisiting them often with the team yeah. is really important because when you mention it, like during onboarding, right. Or the interview process, it's always important to bring everybody back to why are we doing what we're doing and remembering our story and what brought us here so that you don't lose track of your core focus and your mission and your values. Um, and, that's something that's really helpful for us. So we make sure we do it at the very least every 90 days, we come back and reset with the entire team on why we're doing what we're doing. And it can seem redundant at times, but sometimes you need it more than others. So just doing it every 90 days really helps. Yeah, that's a, that's a great practice. That's awesome. Especially be able to take the time out of a busy day with everyone and to sit down and reevaluate and maybe, you know, share new stories to help even internally grow the brand as well. That's part of the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, what advantages as a leader have you noticed um, that come from putting the people and purpose first within the organization? Um, well, something else we do, every person, every full-time team member at Verity is on a stock option plan. So everyone's an owner in the business. And I think that really helps to, it it just feels different when you're working for your company, right? And we all own this company together. So that makes a really big difference in helping people stay focused on one, your your work ethic and drive for success, but two, your integrity, right? And making sure that we're building something that they can be really proud of because it's all of ours. Um, So that's something that's important that we do. Um, But I think it just comes back again to the people and just getting the right people in place and then they make the right decisions and keep you on track. Absolutely. So the advantages are that it sounds like you're able to um, cultivate more ownership of the organization, um, ownership and integrity with the work that they do. Um, There's something really amazing about employee-owned companies and there's there's data on it. There's, you know, many, many... um, Reports have been created around just how much more effective the organization is uh, overall and more successful. So that's great. And how did that kind of form to be? Like, how did that, it, was that at the very start you decided to be an employee-owned company? Well, I, so I worked for a startup right out of college and everybody who worked at that company had stock options. And so I don't think I thought that there was ever another way to do it, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> And I I know that other people do it differently, but I saw how much more motivated and excited the team was where I worked. And I felt like it was a really unique experience. And honestly, working at a startup is a lot of work. So everybody deserves to be a part of that growth and success and to share in the wins. So I, I can't honestly imagine it any other way. It's too much work to ask somebody to come to work for somebody else to do. (laughs) They have to be coming to work for themselves too. Yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. So what you're saying is um, the, um, the stakeholders are very, very instrumental to the success of the organization. Like Absolutely. Amazing. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. Um, how has putting people on purpose first, have you been able to kind of keep track of, you know, is there any bottom line? Have you, is there a way to measure, you know, the success of, of, our, of the organization in that term? 
Uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, everyone who's been in business right knows how much money you spend on turnover, right? So if people leave and you have to retrain, it's it's really time consuming. And I think by really focusing on making this a great place to work and creating great opportunities for the team, it keeps people here because if they're happy, they stay. <laughs> and it keeps the company on track to not have delays and um in the traction. And when you get a lot of traction and progress, bringing on a new person really takes a long time. So yep. I think as an early stage company, I think that's the biggest thing is just not losing time because you have turnover and having people who are motivated and happy and they're doing better work too. And it sounds like the customers on, on their end too, um, you're able to track and measure just how much impact you're having on the planet um, yep. because of the work that you're doing as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, essentially, um, yeah, you're exactly right. So it's, it's really taking all of that into consideration and the customers are going to benefit from having a team that sticks around right? and having that continuity in their relationships. Yeah, that's awesome. So tell me what's next for Verdi. Do you have anything on the horizon or <laughs> in the works? <laughs> Yeah, so we have a lot of new products in development right now. We've been so fortunate to partner with some really forward-thinking brands of all sizes. And now we're just working on being able to supply them with a more complete catalog offering so that they can put their entire product oh. together. together. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the goal is just... Um, to continue to provide more options so that people can move their entire product line from single use plastic into reusable or, or highly recyclable metals. Awesome. Um, and if you had, well, first I want to ask you, what is, what is something someone, no one would guess about you? Like what is, is there anything that people would be like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, for real? <laughs> I'm a pretty open book. I feel like everybody probably, I talk a lot. Everybody knows everything about me. Um, I was an Irish dancer when I was in middle school, like late on like middle school. <laughs> and I um, got into Irish dancing when, and I never got very far. So I can't, I wasn't like river dancer. <laughs> but when I did get into it is when I grew up in Baltimore is when the Pope came to visit Baltimore and we got to dance for the Pope. So oh my great. gosh. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. That's, That's awesome. Maybe one thing. I was more of an athlete. I was not much of a dancer or artist. I was always an athlete. I played lacrosse. So probably that would surprise most people, but everything else I think they know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, if you, what advice would you give a business leader who wants to take their organization into being either an employee owned or looking at the planet and impact? What type of resources do you think we need? Hmm. I would say don't hesitate to reach out to on the sustainability side. Don't hesitate to reach out to experts. A lot of the early research we did, I, I would literally read doc, watch documentaries and write down people's names and call them and they would call me back that week. So people who were really passionate about, yeah, it's, people are so open and willing to support like-minded people who, I mean, if they're on a documentary about an issue, they're really passionate about it. Yep. So they want to be able to help move change. So I think um, just don't be shy. Just reach out to people who are experts and start doing your research on that piece. And then on the employee own piece, it's not very hard. I mean, talk to an attorney for an hour and you can get set up on how to build a stock option plan and have somebody manage your cap table so you can bring people on and give them a stock option plan every time they get onboarded. That's awesome. I think that you have shared lots of great stuff. Um, I know many other organizations can learn from you as a leader and from Verity. Um, so thank you again for your time. How do people get to know and hear more about you? Um, so we, if you're interested in keeping up on the company, um, just follow us on Instagram. It's Verity Case, our handle. And you can also go onto LinkedIn. Uh, also Verity Case, so V-E-R-I-T-Y-C-A-S-E. -S -S -E. Awesome. Thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been a pleasure.